Tinakoto, Tinakoto, Tinakoto Katoa. Yeah, welcome to this Regenerations Reimagined Sundowner session on the future makeup of investment portfolios for workplace savings schemes. First of all, a wrap for our sponsors. Um, thanks to all our sponsors who uh, make this conference um, a, 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 a arrive in a very challenging environment, and I think uh, we all thank them for their support uh, because it's what, not the format that we all imagined. Um, I'm joined today by four investment experts who I'm sure uh, you all know well, but need no introduction. But um, And they're going to give us a deep and, and meaningful look at their crystal balls and share with us their thoughts uh, on what the makeup of investment portfolios for restricted schemes should look like over the next number of years, looking out sort of five plus years. Um, before I introduce some Q&A uh, and chats, please, any questions, just use the Q&A and chats function. But on our panel, um, we have Ben Trollope, an actuary with Melville Jessup Weaver. Ben specialises in providing consulting advice to simulation schemes, charitable trusts, and other institutional investors. He provides advice on a wider array of investment matters, including the development of investment objectives, strategic allocation, manager selection, and monitoring and asset liability model modeling. Ben began his career with Melville Jessup Weaver before moving to, uh, to Australia uh, with Willis Towers Watson, where he worked with the, the, the Sydney-based managed research team. He was intimately involved with uh, setting uh, Willis Towers Watson's research view working with the clients, inspecting and developing investment mandates to suit their needs. And he subsequently returned to New Zealand and MJW. Matthew Arnold, uh, Matt's a director at Russell Investments New Zealand. Matt is responsible for leading the New Zealand and South Pacific business at Russell Investments. Uh, the team delivers a range of services that assist investors in meeting their goals, including consulting, outsourced chief investment officer, global multi-asset investing, and implementation of services such as transition management and overlay. Uh, prior to joining Russell Investments in 2019, Matt worked for a decade at State Street Global Advisors in the UK and Singapore. We held a variety of research, strategy, and sales roles in the global SPDR traded ETF business. Earlier in his career, he worked at several global investment managers in the UK and US. Noah Skilknecht. Noah is the consultant at Makawa Investments. Noah founded Makawa Investments to help lift the investment advice in New Zealand and the Pacific to a better standard and to make advice more affordable for smaller institutional clients. Before founding Makawa Investments, Noah was the head of the institutional team at Russell Investments New Zealand, advising a broad range of large institutional clients on investment strategy asset allocation and manager select and selection. In his two decades in financial services, Noah has gained experience in infrastructure evaluation, capital management, and structuring of insurance risk transfer solutions. And finally, Rowan McCabe. Rowan is a partner of Mercer's Investment Solutions Business. As a Chief Investment Officer, New Zealand, and Head of Portfolio Management Pacific, Rowan is responsible for the New Zealand Investment Management Team and all Mercer Funds New Zealand as well as having responsibility for leading manager selection and portfolio construction at the asset class level for the Mercer Pacific single sector funds. Prior to joining Mercer in 2019, Ronan gained 15 years uh, investment financial service experience across a range of organisations, and most recently he was senior investment manager at the Ireland Strategic Investment Fund, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Ireland, where he had a team responsible for managing a global investment portfolio. We've certainly got a, a learned team uh, to advise us on um, what's going to happen uh, in the future. But most trustees are concerned with the investment environment looking forward. It seems a lot different to what they've experienced in the past and how they respond to this. What changes do they need to make to their portfolios? What should they tell their members? My panel has um, identified a, a number of key themes that trustees should consider when looking at the makeup of the structure of their portfolios in future years. In this session, we'll look at each of those themes. The panel thought it 
useful to start off by giving some background information to you in order to set the scene for the session and ask Matt to kick things off by presenting this information to you. Thank you, Matt. Um, great. Well, thanks very much, Alistair, and uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for taking time out of your afternoon. Um, yes, we thought it'd be helpful just to um, touch on a few charts that will sort of set the scene for today's discussion um, and make things relevant as well. So um, the first chart we're going to look at today, uh, tough times for income investors. So here we're looking at the dividend yields um, or bond yields of various asset classes going back to when KiwiSaver was launched in October 2007 um, to the March 2009 GFC bottom of equity markets um, to 10 years ago and then today. And we're looking at um, New Zealand cash yields, New Zealand bond yields, global bond yields, New Zealand stocks and global shares. And then in the black line or the dotted line here, we have the prevailing New Zealand CPI rate at the time. Um, so, you know, just looking at that chart um, sort of tells you a pretty interesting story and it's not a comfortable one for income investors. Um, go back to when we had KiwiSaver, um, you could have an income portfolio that would give you a very solid, um, positive, real yield. Um, and over time, we can see that that has gone away um, as bond prices have rallied um, aggressively. Um, yields have obviously come down um, to the extent today where um, the income generated on dividend yields and uh, cash, New Zealand bonds, et cetera, is significantly below um, the rate of inflation. So for, and that has real implications for conservative investors, um, for retirees, and um, anyone who invests in assets, actually, um, you have neg negative real yields. You're going backwards. Um, so that, that's a tough, tough place to be. Um, and that has impl implications for portfolios, which we will um, touch on. Um, if we could move to the next slide, please. Um, so here we're looking at the calendar year returns of the average KiwiSaver um, in, in a conservative strategy versus a growth strategy. Um, and the, the point here is that investing conservatively historically has actually been um, a pretty good way to generate positive real returns with not a lot of volatility. And so we can see that going back to the beginning of KiwiSaver, um, only one year where you had a, had a negative return um, and very consistent positive returns over that, that time period. So over a 10 year basis, you're looking at a conservative fund annualized 6%. Now clearly with where bond yields are, that is not going to happen going forward um, unless you do uh, something a little bit differently. And this panel will discuss that later on. Um, you can see some pretty ugly bond market returns. Um, you might even say it's a New Zealand bond massacre um, when you have the uh, market down 10% over a year. Um, so tough for income oriented investors here. Um, if we could move to the next slide, please, David. Um, so now we touch on a few things. So uh, bond yields, low, uh, low yields. Um, cash is low yielding. What about equities? Um, so this is looking at the price to earnings ratios, both trailing and forward of a few um, markets and um, market segments. Um, so New Zealand, Australia, EM, um, developed markets, and a sector of the US market, large cap growth stocks. Um, and the takeaway here is that based on the traditional PEs, virtually everything looks really expensive. 
Um, I remember back in the olden days when I started my career, you know, an S&P 500 PE of um, 15 looked pretty good. Um, and, and now you've only got emerging markets that is trading at that valuation. Um, so, you know, that has implications for investors too, um, going out the risk curve and so forth. Um, within equities, there are some segments that are incredibly expensive. Large cap growth stocks mentioned there, but even something like Tesla, um, really high valuations. Um, so something that we can discuss uh, further as well. And David, if you go on to the next slide, please. Um, so here we have taken a look at the last 10 years, kind of uh, expanding on what Alistair said and, and comparing that to the next 10 years. And we've used our Russell forecasts, um, but the other chaps will have very similar numbers. And we can see, um, you know, based on, uh, what we think going forward, um, you're probably going to have 50% uh, less return out of your portfolios for the next 10 years um, than you have over the last 10. Um, so real, real challenges there. Um, and if we could go to the next slide, please. And then just a, a, a final sort of slide um, to, and we'll, we'll discuss this uh, towards the end, um, we're just looking at the um, proportion of mutual fund assets globally that are managed in index funds. So we hear a lot about passive eating the world. Um, there's no doubt that uh, there have been significant flows to index funds and so forth. Um, but we can see there the market is still predominantly actively managed. Um, you know, some markets more indexed than others, uh, but overall, um, still plenty of room for active management, and, and we will touch on uh, that, I'm sure, uh, during the session as well. So, listen, hopefully that gave um, you a quick uh, sort of overview of some of the key themes that we plan to expand on uh, today. Yeah. No, thanks for that, Matt. There wasn't much good news and all that, I must admit. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if we're, we're, we're making everyone about that, but happier, but um, it is what it is. But it's pretty evident that um, we're in a low interest rate, low return environment. Um, interest rates and returns across all asset classes sort of not match, matching inflation and with inflation sort of on the move, um, not a good recipe for, for, for a sort of a good outcome. So so how do we adjust portfolios in, in, in the face of this challenging environment? So I'm going to ask each of you in turn um, to give your views on, on, on these important questions that trustees face. But Matt, you might as well, as you're in the swing of things, you might as well kick us off. Yeah, thanks, Alistair. And maybe I'll just um, make one point before mm. handing it off. Um, you know, so what do you do if you, you have lower returns? Either you lower your expectations um, for returns, and that's very difficult to do because you need to um, change your lifestyle, et cetera, if your pension fund potentially lower benefits. Um, you, you, you need to take on more risk, um, which usually means buying more equities. And, and we saw the valuation chart earlier. Um, or the final sort of way that we would think about it is potentially come up with new strategies. Um, so maybe you're looking at new asset classes um, or different types of managing particular asset classes. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it, it's a tough place. We've come from a really strong period of returns um, and we think at, at some stage people are going to uh, have to experience lower returns. Maybe hand it off to the next guy. Okay. Ben, do you want to sort of uh, give us your views? I mean, I, I largely agree with Matt there. I, I see there's really three options. You either um, take more risk uh, or you try to work your portfolio harder to get the returns um, or you change your, you move the goal, goal post, you accept getting lower returns. But I think there's a third option as well. You kind of stick your head in the sand and, and just assume things will continue to track the way they have. And I think up until now, potentially that's been a tempting thing for people to do. Um, yes, we've known that interest rates are low, but we've sort of had central bankers coming to our rescue for a long time. Um, we've, we've seen interest rates on a, on a multi-decade decline 
and we know that um, at some point that party is going to end. Um, but I don't think a, there's been a lot of action until just recently when um, it's really starting to, starting to hurt because inflation has started to rear its head. And what we're observing, especially with our conservative investors, is that they, they're really needing to do something about that. And, and most of them have been squeezed enough on their expectations, pushing them down low enough that they're starting to move up the risk spectrum. So I think I see that as, as, as a trend. Um, I think the responsible thing, though, coupled with that for talking about restricted superannuation schemes is that greater member engagement needs to be had, and especially around those um, schemes that offer member choice and might have members at the conservative end of the spectrum because the outlook for their returns is, is horrible, as, as Matt's just pointed out really well with those, with those charts. And I think uh, there needs to be that engagement so that the members understand that a conservative fund is really just a parking space. If you're in a retirement saving vehicle for anything more than five or 10 years, which many people will be, you have no real reason to be in a conservative fund, even at the best of times, in my, in my opinion. Um, and further to that, I think a lot of people think about age 65 as the end point. When age 65, you probably, you know, unless things go badly for you, you probably still have, you know, a 20 year time horizon on there. And I don't think anyone here would be standing up saying a 20 year time horizon as a conservative fund investor. Now, we all know about sequencing risk and, and things like that, but I think there is a tendency to get overly conservative around that retirement point. Yeah. No, thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave, Ben. Um, Ronan, have you got any brighter news? Um, I'd say, like, you know, in the agreement with the guys, that you know, the big thing will be, you know, what people need to realize is that for the next 10 years going forward to the slides that Matt was shown, returns are not going to be the same as the last 10 years. So I think, you know, people need to accept that. So you either take low returns or more risks. You need better bang for your book. And what that means is, you, you need to think about your portfolios being more efficient. And um, that can come through many different ways. So on the positive side, thinking around diversification, what diversification means is if you think about the different asset classes, but the different earnings or different income streams or revenue streams potentially you have in your portfolio, where that will kind of come into your portfolios through time. And um, also, you know, if you look forward into the, into the future, you know, it's fair to say the last 18 months, has been quite a unusual time in, in, in the last couple of um, decades uh, with COVID and that. But if we think forward uh, and hopefully kind of come through the, the latter stages of COVID, more thinking around innovation, what that means in the portfolio. So it is fair to say where interest rates are uh, at the moment, you know, the expectation is probably more that interest rates will maybe more move more to the upside than the downside, which can be adverse to certain parts of your portfolio. But where you want that, that to come, come into in your portfolios go forward is maybe thinking around that diversification and innovation. And innovation can take many, many different uh, avenues, which I'm sure we'll talk about um, yep. over the coming um, time. But, yeah, you know. That's kind of at a high level. Thanks, Ronan. Noah. Hey, look, um, no uh, better news for, from me, unfortunately. I have to agree mm -hmm. with uh, the, the previous panelists as well. We, we are probably entering a, a lower ret return environment. I think one thing uh, which I think is important, which we sort of haven't talked about just yet, is that it needs to be uh, made transparent to investors as well or to the members in a, in a scheme. I think it's really important that um, people understand what sort of return environment uh, they are facing. And... We've seen a bit of a trend with Kiwi Saver schemes that they're, they're not disclosing return expectations anymore. They're saying something like the moderate fund is expected to have moderate returns. I think we can probably do a bit better than that and, and really need to make sure that we actually make people aware as well that this might be a different environment. Um, the numbers might look a bit uh, sobering and, and a lot lower than uh, what we've uh, seen in the past, as, as Matt sort of pointed out in his slides. But I think it's it's really important to be transparent and, and open about what uh, sort of environment we might face in, in the next 10 years. Yes, that's, 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 really, that's really important, I suppose. In, in the, in the um, restricted scheme space, there tends to be a lot more, so I suppose, direct engagement with members too. Um, so, so it probably makes it more important. And, and, and I imagine trustees um, are a lot keener to make sure that their members are well-informed 
um, as, as they make their life choices to, as they move towards retirement, making sure they can the best from their savings as they can. So that's a good point. Thanks. We're now going to do to um, look at fixed income, you know, bond portfolio allocations and what the, they might look for, like for a conservative investor. And I'm going to ask Ben and Noah if you can sort of um, talk about this. Ben, do you want to kick off as far as this this issue this uh, issue is concerned? Yeah, thanks, Alistair. Look, I'll just offer a few kind of yeah. rambling thoughts because obviously fixed income and cash are the, the challenging sectors, and Matt sort of illustrated what you know what mark to market losses are are looking like, and it is uh, a bond massacre out there at the moment. Mm. Um, and that's that's most acute for the conservative investors, which have 40, 50, 60 percent of their portfolio in fixed income. Um, in, in my view, the, what will happen in portfolios won't for the bulk of portfolios won't start off too radical. Really, I see um, the the most likely changes to be a shortening up of duration in, in the bond portfolios. In fact, we've We've seen that happen already across uh, a lot of the Kiwi Saver funds and, and the like and other restricted schemes. Um, and whether that be through more shorter duration mandates or just simply holding more cash in the portfolio, that's that's the, the first cap of the rank, the kind of easiest thing to do. But that does leave you in a, in a bit of a quandary on the return um, outlook there in a, in a sort of business as usual sense if, if we don't have this um, upwards shock to interest rates. And so I believe... That, that just will lead to higher credit risk in the portfolios. Um, trying to find a short duration bond approach um, that is not just solely reliant on credit is, is pretty hard. And that comes down to the fact that credit is a pretty high information ratio lever, whereas um, duration is a little bit more um, evenly balanced and, and having someone who's got a sustainable um, advantage in duration, active duration management is harder. So I see um, increased use of, of credit, um, perhaps even going to the high yield, certainly more in the securitized type place, and perhaps more in, in global global markets, which offer you know a more a wider range of things. Um, then from there, I see a, a step into alternative fixed income. So things like insurance linked um, securities and catastrophe bonds, um, and then moving into you know, more defensive, well, defensive assets, things that are alternatives to fixed income. And they could be, you know, contrarian strategies or hedge fund strategies, which are designed to be negatively correlated with risk assets um, or commodities or things like gold, which are decided, um, um, designed to be an inflationary type hedge. Look, if you want to be very blue sky, you can and think far into the future. You can say, well, may, maybe we see something in the, the cryptocurrency end of things that's worked out to be a substitute for fixed income. We've seen El Salvador has int- um, has uh, issuing a so-called Bitcoin bonds. Um, I think that's got a long way to go at the moment. Those are just bets on Bitcoin, but I think I'm sure there's plenty of smart people working on how we can digitize um, fixed income assets. And I think it's only a matter of time before those start cropping up and for more of the more uh, brave investors. Mm. Yeah, they're just... just um... This innovation and diversification is kind of a theme coming through, isn't it? Noah, um, what's your what's your view? Yeah, I, I think there is actually still a place for um, sort of more traditional bond portfolios in in, in some of the the strategies uh, we we look at. One of the challenges is what's the alternative? What will actually provide you some downside protection? when equity markets uh, fall. And um, history tells us that quite often bonds still do provide some of the protection. Um, just think about what happened, uh, um, I guess, uh, late last uh, week or, or the week before um, when uh, the new variant sort of caused a bit of trouble. Sure enough, um, rates uh, fell and um, fixed income, the traditional fixed income provided a bit of um, protection. So. Um, it's it's not great um, looking at what kind of returns you get from bonds, but in terms of actually providing you with a bit of downside protection, I think there's there's still a case to 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 be made for bonds. Some of the alternatives are, are either very expensive, so, such as buying, I guess, downside protection through options, or hard to value, like uh, gold comes to mind, 
or um, quite volatile if you think about some of the defensive equity strategies or, or safe haven currencies. So it's not great to, to invest uh, in, in bonds at these low rates, but I think there's still a place if you have a diversified portfolio. And, and I think that's something which is really important to remember. Um, having sort of a bit of a bond mass sector is, is not great, but if you have actually equities that during that uh, period provided you with a lot of extra return, uh, then potentially things don't look as, as bad anymore. So, um, yeah, while uh, the environment is not great for bonds, uh, I think there's still a role for sort of the more traditional fixed income allocation in portfolios. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Nick. No, no just, just uh, sort of moving to sort of private markets briefly. Um, what about private markets? You know, what are we going to see here as far as portfolio um, allocation is concerned? Look, I, th I think there's going to be a lot of interest. Um, um, there's uh, whenever return the in return environment is low as as it is right now, uh, people start to to look at alternatives, and and private assets are, are definitely one place to look for. A lot of studies tell us that if you give up liquidity, you actually might be able to eke out uh, a bit of extra return. So uh, fundamentally, there's that's an attractive area to consider. Um, the problem is that that quite often these strategies are, are quite concentrated and, and therefore potentially a lot riskier and a lot more dependent on the manager performing well compared to the listed space where you so, sort of always get a bit of, of that market return with the strategy, no matter how well um, the manager has done. So, um, yeah, definitely an, an interesting area. And I think particularly interesting is uh, what we've sort of uh, seen uh, more and more is, is investments in, in impact investments. Um, we've seen a, yeah. a few in KiwiSaver. Um, I think that's a very interesting part of, of the private market where actually investors are trying to uh, achieve a positive outcome um, and a positive return as well. And I think that might be an area where they're might be quite a bit of, of interest in, in New Zealand over the next few years. Yeah, that's good, yeah. And Ben, do you want to add to that? No, I agree with everything Noah yeah. said. I think this idea of impact investments or green investments uh, will certainly gather space, gather, yeah. gather pace. And I think at the same time, we'll also see fee, fee pressure coming on as um, private markets um, become more and more widely used within the portfolios. There's, as well as um, private equity, which is what most people think of, there's obviously also the private debt um, end of the mm. spectrum, and that does offer um, something that's perhaps more appropriate for the conservative end of uh, investors, um, loans and the like. So, again, going down that credit risk spectrum, mm. but um, I expect to see a lot more of that in um, conservative portfolios. Um, the only thing that gives me a bit of pause is that we, we've had a while since our last liquidity crunch, and um, those with long memory will remember a few of the funds that ran to trouble in previous crises, um, um, these direct funds. And that's not necessarily a, a problem uh, unless you get the sizing wrong and unless you have member equity issues. And I do worry that the, some of those lessons about sizing and member e equity might, have, uh, might start to be forgotten um, when this rush to find, uh, scrape up any kind of return. Yeah, yeah. Well, those private markets, your, your liquidity sort of, there's a liquidity issue with the private markets too, aren't there, which need to be managed, um, which you sort of alluded to. No, thanks. Thank you for that. Um, and actually, that talk talk about impact investing and, and green bonds alike sort of leads to our next topic, which is um, Ronan and Matt, uh, sort of ESG factors, climate change demands, you know, carbon neutrality um, requirements, et cetera. So all that, that sort of area, what sort of, um, what impact is this going to have on investment portfolios? Yeah. So, so what about Ronan? Over yeah. Thanks, yeah. I think it's fair to say that the, the, the theme around ESG or environmental, social and governance will be kind of key part of portfolios uh, going forward. And you know, we already see that, uh, but it will be very much, while well, in the past maybe it's been an add-on to the investment process and an add-on to portfolios, it is very much... You know, you've definitely seen that since advent of COVID, but going forward, we'll be very much integrated into investment processes and uh, into portfolios for managers. And you can kind of think around ESG around, you know, kind of four kind of key pillars around active ownership, you know, being a good steward of capital, uh, ESG or sustainable investing and what that means, um, ESG integration into portfolios. And so that will be data analytics and finally exclusions and screening 
uh, which there might be a role uh, every now and again for that, but it, it shouldn't be the, the main lever in the portfolio. And that, that leads on to climate change. And it, it is fair to say that you know, climate change is probably one of the biggest risks in portfolios going forward. Um, it's probably the, one of the biggest challenges and risks I think society faces um, over the coming decades. And more and more you will see it out in the portfolio. So begin to think about what that means in, in, in client portfolios. Um, like the world is on a decarbonisation pathway. So how is that integrated into your portfolios um, will, will be kind of a key thing in portfolios so around the idea of actually sustainable investing. So in the infrastructure space, investing in renewable um, uh, assets or renewable sectors and um, staying away from those more kind of carbon heavy uh, sectors and um, <clears throat> being an active owner of companies voting where, where applicable uh, around climate change and you know, making sure that ESG and the whole concept uh, holistically of what ESG is, is integrated in the process. Well, climate change is, is obviously the biggest challenge probably going to be uh, in the portfolios in a low-income uh, world going forward. Yeah, and maybe I'll just add, add, add to that. I mean, clearly the last couple of years have been when ESG investing has really come of age, I think. Um, you know, if you look at what's happened in New Zealand um, at the crown level with the, the crown financial institutions, they've been directed really um, to take some concrete steps to um, firstly measure, manage, and then influence the, um, the, the carbon footprint and the environmental impact of their portfolios. Um, you've seen that on the KiwiSaver default side as well, um, where fossil fuels were, were banned. So this is really a train that um, ha has started to gather momentum and there's really no turning back, I think. Um, I would say all of us here will say ESG is just part of investing now um, and, and um, you know, in four or five years' time, it might seem ridiculous that anyone invested without thinking about um, the impact on the environment, for instance. Um, so, yeah, no doubt, no doubt it's um, really gathered steam. If you look at flows globally, um, this was the record year by a by long, um, long shot. So um, what started in Europe... Um, you know, has been widely adopted in Australasia, has, has flown through to the US and Asia increasingly as well. Um, so it's a, a really gathered momentum. Uh, you're on mute there, Alistair. No, no a question has come through for you. This is, this is an impact um impact investing sort of question. So you, 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 you mentioned it, so you get the question. Um, it just, just, it's, it's reconciling um, the, the overriding legal requirement to, to maximise investment returns uh, against you know, the, the, the social good, I suppose. Uh, and a lot of the ESG has traditionally been um, uh, in this sort of um, in this, this concern. I think what we're hearing ESG is now mainstream um, because ESG considerations do go to, to to returns, but what about impact investing? What's your what's your view of that? Look, look, that's 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 a great question, and and yes, it's possible that potentially you might have to compromise on on return. I guess there's different ways of thinking about it. Maybe it's it's a separate option to to some of the other investment options. That could be one way to to deal with this. Uh, maybe it's about uh, being open and transparent uh, about some of the investments um, that are included, but I, I don't think it's it's as black and white as as maybe that question sounds. Um, there's a lot of things that that happen in investment portfolios where these questions are typically never brought up. For example, how much home buyers should you have? Say in, in fixed income, where typically you don't get a return advantage out of having a home buyers. You could argue that's possibly a problem as well in terms of optimizing your return, but but you'd never hear anyone saying that that is going to be a problem in in, in terms of the legal requirements. So mm -hmm. look, ultimately, it's maybe more a question for someone like you, Alistair, in, in in terms of what the legal ramifications are. But I think being transparent, potentially having it in a in a separate option, are, are possible ways um, to answer that question. 
Yeah. I, I think maybe I can just jump in there. I think there's going to be an evolution of what impact investing means. So you have obviously at the one extreme end where it's some sort of social impact and financial returns are maybe less of a consideration. But I think there's a balance there for a lot of people who want to impact investing where if you think about it from a double bottom line perspective, that investment will need to be viewed through the lens of giving a financial return, a compensated uh, financial return, as well as some sort of impact. And um, you know, if, if you just have purely financial return, it, it doesn't have impact within the impact space. And, you know, we, we kind of forget about it, but, you know, prior to the 1970s, um, we, we, you know, it was very much capitalism, probably more around stakeholder capitalism, which was the full gambit from shareholders right through to employees and society in general. And it's probably changed a bit since the 1970s, but you will, um, you, you will already, you, you start to see a shift in this. People will want to see more and more of some sort of impact, whatever shape, form that it is, into portfolios and it's it's a spectrum of what impact is one extreme end but I do think there's a balance there between that there's certain areas where you can get impact as well as adequate or financial returns again for taking appropriate levels of risk and I think that that would be an evolution of how people will begin to think about uh, this side of things going forward. Thanks for that Ronan. We're now going to move forward to talk about um, I suppose China um, and emerging markets, and probably some geo, geo, geopolitical factors that might influence the makeup of portfolios. Um, ben Ronan, um, I'll start with you, Ben. Um, so, what are your views on um, on what's going to happen with China as far as investment in China is concerned in emerging markets? Well, well, look, I, I guess my my first point would be that there are always going to be geopolitical risks out there. There's always going to be something on the horizon um, and my experiences with investors who are coming to investment markets or moving down the risk spectrum for the first time, that there's always some reason to hold back because there's there's a market crash around the corner or there's there's problems in the Middle East or, or geopolitical tensions between the US and China. So I, I don't think this um, necessarily completely turfs our traditional investment management theory or the way to do things. But look, with that said, I, I think the rise of China and its challenge to traditional powers in, in the West is, is probably one of the most significant events of our, our time. And it, it does need um, some consideration. In my mind, this uh, leads me more to uh, an active kind of management view of the world when it comes to this, this particular sector. Um, and, and I think that's because getting the right weight to, to places like China and getting the right um, companies within that weight, I, I believe is, is an active decision or one that can be better served by by activeness um we, we're starting to see some some particularly acute things um the uh the issues around dd and the educa private education um companies that happened through through this year that show i think that just investing passively into uh emerging market stocks is is not without risk and um a risk that probably is best actively managed and actively understood Thanks, Ben. Um, Ronan? Yeah, I think, you know, notwithstanding the geopolitics and the, um, around China and its role in the world, I think, you know, it, it's, it's worth, you know, considering, you know, what is China, China where should play parts in a portfolio. So, but different measures, it's either the first or second largest economy in the world, which is the largest population in the world. Chinese bond market is the second largest bond market in the world after the US. The Shanghai and Shenzhen combined stock markets are the third largest after New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. Um, so if you put them, you know, but if you, the role of China portfolios is probably underrepresented. So if you purely take it through that lens, you know, there is probably more of a role for greater allocations to China. Having said that, um, as Ben spoke about, there is obviously certain geopolitics considerations uh, with China. And it is very much that they are <clears throat> trying to play the role of the upstart uh, and maybe come competing somewhat with the US. And that, through time, brings certain amount of tensions. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean there will be some sort of conflict that maybe that's sometimes portrayed, but it's definitely a kind of consideration uh, that people need to be aware of. And it, it very well it might be that that in itself brings certain elements of volatility. It doesn't necessarily mean 
we want to have an allocation or not have an allocation of China portfolios. But as Ben said, it's probably definitely more of a consideration to having an active allocation to China portfolios as opposed to purely passive. What's interesting also within China itself and enrolled portfolios, there's a differentiation between China onshore and China offshore equities. The China onshore is more that kind of consideration of actually the China domestic economy and less about the export side of things that we generally think about China. And the Chinese economy over the last number of years has moved more and more to a service-based economy that we typically see in more developed countries. And this is a reflective of China onshore shares. And within that market itself, there's certain structural inefficiencies, which leads to actually a lot of high active management potential within China itself. So, you know, from, you know my consideration would be that, A, yeah, there is a role for China definitely in portfolios. It's probably underrepresented. Uh, there's definitely going to be geopolitics going, going forward. Uh, but geopolitics, is, as Ben said, is very much part and parcel of investing and thirdly that if you are going to think about allocating to china an active uh, element is probably more of a consideration than purely passive yeah thanks Ronan. do you think um you know you know china being such a, a big market you, you just told us how big it is where, where do you think china is actually going to be um uh, so, so sphere separated from some emerging markets or separated from i suppose the brick the brick economies uh, and, and become its own its own thing, <laughs> you know, like Japan, the US, et cetera. When, when, when will that happen? Yeah, look, I think, you know, there, there, you, you are beginning to see people think about emerging markets ex China and a bit separate China allocation. And um, so those conversations were already beginning to happen and they're beginning to, and best managers are beginning to kind of deviate between the two. And mm. um, so there are different kind of considerations. So I, I suspect sometime in the next five to 10 years, uh, Merge market allocation will be broken into China and EMX China, but for certain investors, maybe um, more kind of smaller investors, will still be a role of you know emerging markets in the traditional sense how we think about merger markets. But for people that want to take a more sophisticated approach, I think breaking merger markets into EMX China and China, I think, will be a way in the future. Mm. Thanks, Ron. And Alistair, could I just add something yes, here? Um, we're talking about kind of opportunities. <laughs> if we go back to that first valuation chart, um, when, when we looked at global equities, you know, emerging markets um, sort of stand alone as being a cheap value opportunity as of today. Um, so, yes, you're going to need some stomach, you would think, because of these issues. There's always issues in emerging markets. Um, but just from a pure valuation perspective, relative to U.S. stocks, for instance, um, you would have to think um, that the, the potential for emerging markets over the next decade um, is better than over the last decade rel relative to the U.S., um, so that, that will be really interesting from a New Zealand context to see um, whether, you know, um, restricted schemes, Kiwi savers, et cetera, start to allocate more to emerging markets on the equity front, um, but also on, on the bond front too. Yeah. 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 Well, no. uh, yes, uh, just, just quickly as, as well, I think it's also important to remember that even if you don't have a dedicated emerging markets allocation, you, you are typically exposed to emerging markets and participating in, in that growth. There's a lot of companies in, in the US, in, in Europe, that have huge exposure to emerging markets. However, they are domiciled in, in Europe and the US. So I think it's always important to remember that actually your exposure to emerging markets might grow, even if you're not increasing your, your allocation to emerging markets as such. Yeah, I think, I think that's an important point to what we were saying at the beginning around different return drivers. So if we think about the New Zealand market, there are definitely parts of the New Zealand economy that will be exposed to the Chinese economy in some shape or form. So doubling up on your dedicated China exposure from a New Zealand perspective, you need to kind of just think through your portfolio of where that may be. Um, and so it, it's a case of looking through. So it's not just a case of seeing what the the name on the, the tin is, so to speak, you know, so there's a lot of, for example, Chinese companies that are listed in the US uh, that might be classified from a 
listing perspective is US exposure, but really their, their Chinese exposure, even though they might be global in nature, uh, Chinese exposure and exposed to whatever the regulatory regime may be in China at certain points in time. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. And then the final thing we talked about revolves around um, sort of KiwiSaver um, and the impact that the growth in, in, in the KiwiSaver, we know what the projections are as to how much capital inflow there's going to be into KiwiSaver schemes, um, what that will have on, on restricted scheme space and also um, the downward pressure of fees that, that is sort of led by, by, by KiwiSaver. And also, Matt showed us earlier, earlier on um, as far as the growth of uh, index or, or passive funds, um, which we're also seeing in New Zealand. So what impact is this going to have as far as um, portfolio makers are concerned? So that's Noah. Noah, are you going to lead us off um, with this? Yeah, sure. Um, look, uh, first of all, before we start to talk about KiwiSaver, just, yeah. just a quick shout out to uh, workplace saving schemes and, and I guess also to financial advisors. There's, there's other, other parts of, of the industry as well that play an important role in, in uh, financial um, savings and, and retirement planning. Um, but yeah, it's, it's clear that KiwiSaver has been, has been a success story. And, and I think it's, it's fair to sort of uh, pay tribute to, to the late Michael Cullen as well for, for actually having, having it set up. It's, its growth has, has been uh, very impressive. And I think overall, um, the experience has, has been really positive as well for, for members. I think the one thing that I would like to see change is that, that hopefully we'll have a bit more investments in, in New Zealand as well. And I mean, new investments, new companies listed on the exchange, maybe some money going into infrastructure where we all know there's, there's a need for, for more infrastructure investment in New Zealand. And that's something, I guess, looking back that unfortunately has been a bit disappointing. And, you know, that's almost a separate debate. But unfortunately, the listings on the New Zealand share market haven't really kept up with the growth in KiwiSaver. And I think that will be something that will be really great to see that that changes going forward, that actually we have more investments in New Zealand as well with the New, New Zealand stock market hopefully growing in line with um, KiwiSaver. Yeah, and, and, and maybe I'll just add to that, Alistair. So um, as Noah mentioned and everyone knows, KiwiSaver has been a tremendous success. Um, this, the, the simple portfolio ha has done pretty well since the launch of KiwiSaver. So global equities, global bonds, New Zealand shares, et cetera. Um, the, the question is, you know, over time or the next 10 years, do, do we see um, other asset classes finding, finding their way into um, KiwiSaver? I think as the guys mentioned on private assets, we are starting to see that. Um, it would be great to see, um, you know, venture capital, infrastructure, et cetera, as well um, in KiwiSaver. That, that is sort of related to the fee question as well. Um, so there's been a lot of focus on fees. Um, and I guess from our point, you know, clearly fees are important. Um, I personally don't think that retail investors should be paying 2% for balanced funds um, or bog standard equity funds, 3% even, and you do see this out there. Um, but I, I don't think it means that the right answer for everyone is 100% passive and the lowest fee there. So there, there does need to be a balance. Um, if you are using active management, that does cost more than indexing. Um, and, and guess what? There will be periods of time when active underperforms. But again, that doesn't mean that it's not a valid and reasonable strategy. Um, so, you know, I think there, there does need to be a balance in the fee discussion. Um, we're talking about KiwiSaver, um, but it relates to workplace saving schemes as well, I think. Yeah, I think on, on fees, um, I, I think there will be more downward uh, pressure. I, I think margins are still comfortable across the industry, and I think there's still room for uh, fees to be reduced, and, and that could be both in, in active and in, in passive management. So as a, as a consultant, you won't hear me say a bad word about uh, fee pressure. 
Um, the other thing that uh, could be sort of the flip side is actually seeing some more innovation as well in Kiwi Saver, and, and uh, Matt sort of alluded to it, uh, maybe some new strategies or, or a different way of, of how portfolios are put together. So that could be the, the alternative to sort of lowering the fees, actually bringing some new innovation into how Kiwi Saver is, is done going forward. I think just to jump off that point, my perception uh, KiwiSaver, what it has done is given us a very um, transparent and um, talked about industry of investment management. And it's it's done its bit to increase just general financial li literacy. I th there's still some way to go, uh, in my opinion, but I think people are much more engaged with um, retirement savings these days. And KiwiSaver has shown um, uh, the there is market for, for a range of different things, whether it be, you know, just purely concentrate on low fees, um, the likes of um, smart shares and super life, or concentrate on highly active investments or private investments, or, you know, off the beaten past and path into um, really niche strategies or ethical investment. KiwiSaver is sort of this um, uh, flagship that shows that, that responds to where the market demand is. And I think that, illustrates um, oh, that, that that bodes well for the broader investment industry that can kind of look at the KiwiSaver strategies or marketing things that are successful and build products to meet that need. Certainly from where I sit, we've, we've seen a lot of um, uh, particularly employers that have both KiwiSaver and uh, your workplace savings schemes looking at uh, have, having mirroring different portfolios. And so um, you have a, the conservative or balance of the same for both. And so you, you're getting the workplace and following the Kiwi saver as well. Um, just a question's come through on, this is on property. Um, uh, what's, what's, uh, what's your views of the next 10 years for, for listed property sector versus infrastructure, both not just in, in New Zealand, but also um, globally? Who wants to handle this? I might... Right. So it's basically listed property versus listed infrastructure. Yes. Yeah. So we think about global. I think coming back to what we spoke about, we can some of those kind of trends and thinking about innovation. I think you know the way you can think about listed property, listed infrastructure to start to set the, the foundations is one is as we move to a more digitalized world, um, how we think about those those particular asset classes are changing. So. You know, even five years ago, the, the concept of data warehouses, data towers, and, you know, logistical warehouses, we buy more and more online. These are becoming parts of what's listed property, listed infrastructure. I think listed property from a commercial perspective, it's fair to say that when we do go back to the office, it may not be five days a week. So what does this do from an evaluation perspective um, of property? But also in this infrastructure, if we think about it in the climate change perspective and a decarbonized world, listed infrastructure by itself is probably the is most carbon intensive uh, or the highest carbon footprint of any asset class out there uh, for like 100% allocation. What you will begin, and the reason for that is, and that's globally, the reason for it is a huge part of those indexes are um, pipelines for fossil fuel, which you need, like if, if you need to have some sort of gas or some sort of oil, there's pipelines that are classified in the infrastructure space. What you will begin to see is, you know, those, those weights and those indices and in infrastructure will, will, will trend downwards as we go into a decarbonized world and we we'll replace by more renewable um, aspects, renewable sectors, uh, properly to get more and more efficient. So that's kind of setting the scene. It, it's fair to say probably properly sold off more than infrastructure at this point in time. Uh, going forward, they both face certain headwinds, um, but also if interest rates rise, it will be a headwind, further headwind for both those asset classes, but in a rising inflation environment, it will be positive for both those asset classes. So it's kind of hard to, you know, I'm not going to take a punt on one versus the other. I think it's fair to say, though, that they're exactly to what we're talking through here is from a, a low interest rate environment, inflation, uh, ESG and climate change, um, there's certain kind of headwinds, but also tailwinds. There's certain challenges and opportunities in both spaces, both in New Zealand and globally going forward. But again, come back to the idea of innovation, diversification, what that means, um, you're going to see that play out quite a lot in both those sectors. Thanks, Ronan. And maybe I could just add one thing on... Um, sure, Matt. 
Um, just on infrastructure, if there's ever an asset class that appears to have sort of strong secular growth potential, that would be it, I would say. You know, virtually every country on earth, New Zealand, you know, more than most is, is short of infrastructure. So you would expect um, uh, significant spending. I think the really interesting thing about that as a sector is how it has changed, as Ronan mentioned. Um, you know, you look at Infratil today um, with data warehouses and so forth, very different to what it was in 93 when it kicked off. And that's um, sort of a, a sign of how infrastructure has evolved over time. Mm. Lovely, Noah. Yeah, just quickly adding to that as well, I, I think Rona mentioned sort of the high carbon intensity and, and that can be a bit off-putting for, for certain investors, but I think it's really important to realize that infrastructure is, is going to be part of the solution as well. It might be part of the problem right now, but it's definitely going to be part of the, the solution as well, as, as Matt sort of uh, alluded to as well. So uh, I, I think it's a, it's a really interesting sector um, on a forward-looking basis. Mm. Excellent. Thank you for that. Well, we're just coming to the end, so so I think um, um, just thank I want to thank our panelists um, immensely for for um, I think it was a very informative session. The things that struck out stuck for me are um, I think what the member engagement piece, particularly for the workplace savings, very important that there is strong member engagement, lowering expectations over the next ten years. They're not going to be what the last ten years um, bought. Um, and, and, and transparency. I think that's uh, that's a, a key message that you've given us today. Um, the other things I've written down here are sort of diversification, innovation. Um, you know, that looking for the makeup of portfolios uh, might look a lot different in five years to what they do now. Um, looking at a more alternative, uh, more innovative ways of trying to get a better return for investors. But of course, a lot of that goes with risk. Um, so new strategies and taking on more risk to try and um, uh, and get better returns for, for our members um, is a challenge because more risk goes well more risk is more risk isn't it so having to manage that risk is is, um, is going to be a big part of the, the future as well but no, look thank 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 you uh, Matt Rowan Ronan Ben Noah thank you for your contribution um, and also thank you again for for our sponsors uh, for for the conference but also I want to make a picture of that for Smart Shares. Um, Smart Shares are, are sponsors for this particular session, so I thank Smart Shares for um, for making this session possible. Um, Smart Shares, of course, is a uh, provides a comprehensive range of um, global domestic ETFs that they cover all um, investment classes and are all listed uh, on the NZX. And of course, they own SuperLife, um, which provides KiwiSaver. Uh, superannuation and investment um, solutions for, for members and employers. So thank you, Smart Shares, for supporting this section. Um, and finally, um, the conference um, day one of the of the of the uh, uh, of the conference today, uh, tomorrow day two. Um, so there's a heavy 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 morning tomorrow, starting with breakfast at eight o'clock with a fintech life insurance investment and KiwiSaver sessions. So please uh, please join one of those. And the main uh, plenary uh, platform heads off at 9.15 and the, the first session there is a uh, uh, conversation with Jeff, Blank, Jeff Blanchard, uh, uh, Baskin, sorry, uh, Jeff Baskin, the uh, Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank, talk about the Reserve Bank. So uh, thank you for your attendance and we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Mm -hmm.